Good morning, Trinity Church. My name is Pastor Jeff, and it is Sunday, April 25th. I am glad to be with you here this morning for our worship service as we continue our sermon series, Worrier or Warrior? Changing one thing can change everything. And we're taking a look at Matthew chapter 6, a small segment of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount to look at worry and anxiety and how we can overcome that and follow the words of Jesus as he taught us by saying, do not worry. How do we get there? Come with me on this journey over the next few weeks as we figure out Jesus' teaching on worry and how to overcome that and move from being a perennial worrier to a prayerful warrior. A few announcements as we get started. First, on May 5th, we're going to be starting a brand new book study on the subject of racism. This is something that I believe our culture needs to be looking at if we ever hope to get better as a world. We need to be examining this issue from a variety of different viewpoints. Our lay leader, Heather Birch, will be leading a book study May 5th at 7 p.m. It's going to go, I believe, for six weeks. And if you're interested in that, please sign up in our Welcome Center or contact the church office for more information. We have another book study on May 11th that will be led by Drew Harvey. That is on the book of Hebrews. And we invite you to join us for that as well. That will also be at 7 p.m. and go for six weeks on Tuesday nights. 
On May 15th, it's a Saturday, our church is having a volunteer work day to get done with some of the sprucing up of the church property, some landscaping, and some other items here at the church property as well as down at the parsonage. If you would like to take part in that, it's going to be at 9 a.m. on Saturday, May 15th, and you can sign up in our Welcome Center or contact the church office for more information on that as well. We're going to be having a safety team meeting this week as we're hopefully moving in the right direction as a nation and as the state of Pennsylvania. We hope to see our case counts go down. Uh, we do hope that as more people get vaccinated that we can begin to relax a little bit. And I'm not quite sure what that's going to look like yet or when, but I do want to let you know that we are having a safety team meeting soon and we will hopefully be able to have some more information for you in the weeks to come. In the meantime, we are still wearing masks. We are still following our COVID protocols for in-person worship. And we invite you to come back to church. We invite you to join us for in-person worship. We are being safe. We are following these safety measures and we are worshiping God together in this new context. We hope that you'll join us for that worship. And finally, today is Confirmation Sunday, so you won't be able to see it online here, but at our 9.30 service this morning, we are welcoming three new confirmands into membership at Trinity the United Methodist Church. It is a special day in the life of the church where these three young teenagers renew their commitments to Jesus Christ and confirm their membership here at the church. We look forward to that, and we look forward to celebrating that this morning. At this time, let's go to God in prayer. Almighty God, we give you thanks for this day. Lord, the chance to celebrate new confirmands, the chance to worship you together. And as we seek your presence here this morning, we pray that we would feel your Holy Spirit move and work within us and through us to reach the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please follow along with the words on the screen as we sing our opening songs, Freely, Freely, and Be Strong in the Lord. Both of these are used with permission from the publisher.
Hi, boys and girls. For our children's message this morning, I want to ask you to make a choice. If I were to offer you one of these two eggs to open and to tell you that there's a prize inside each one, which one would you choose? Which one do you think has the better prize inside? Now, most of us usually think the big one is the best one, right? Because bigger is better. Let's take a look and see what's in the big egg. Oh, there's something in there. It looks like money. There's a dollar bill inside of the bigger egg. Let's see what's in the smaller egg. It's harder to open. There we go. The smaller egg also has money in it. Oh, it's got a $20 bill inside. Now, how many of you chose the bigger egg? The bigger egg looks better. It looks bigger, but it actually had a smaller reward inside. The smaller egg had the bigger reward. Because it's what's inside that counts, really, isn't it? And I want to share with you all some thoughts on how the world looks at things and how Jesus looks at things. The way the world looks at things, we want things now. We want what is bigger, we want what is better, and we want it here, we want it now. Jesus comes along and he tells us that the kingdom of God happens now, but that it also happens later. And Jesus teaches us that waiting is worth it, and that there are things that are worth waiting for. And so we need to learn to look at things, to look at life through the eyes of Jesus. And instead of always thinking that what's bigger is better, sometimes good things come in small packages. Sometimes good things are worth waiting for, and it takes time to develop good things. I think of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. All of those things are things that take time to develop. But when we develop them, they have a lasting impression on us and on the people that we meet. So I want to encourage you today, take time to get to know God. Take time to grow in Christ. And I believe that you will have a greater reward than anything you could ever get in this world. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you that you teach us the importance of what we should truly be looking for in life. And it isn't always the things that this world offers. Instead, help us to look at what you offer in your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For our pastoral prayer time this morning, I invite you to share your praises and prayers with us online. If it is non-confidential and you're wanting to share it with your fellowship of believers here on Facebook, please enter it into the chat and let us know how we can pray for you. If you'd like to contact me throughout the week with a more confidential prayer request or a praise or something you'd like to share with me, please let me know and I'd be glad to pray for you and to pray with you. At this time, let's go to God in prayer. Almighty God, we come before you today. We lift up to you our praises. And we rejoice in the relationship that we have with you, in the love that you give to us, and in the hope that you offer each and every one of us. Lord, we also come with our struggles. We come with our humanity, our pride, our pain. And Lord, we ask that you would find a way through for us, that you would help us to leave those struggles at the foot of the cross. Help us to place our trust in you, to place our faith in you, and to redirect our lives, to follow the way of Jesus, so that we can let go of those things that hold us back in our faith and take hold of the things that you have in store for us. Lord, help us to trust you, we pray. When it comes to the world around us, we see the struggles. We see the heartache. We see the brokenness. We see the injustice. And Lord, we ask that you would show us the way, that you would help to heal our nation and our world, and that you would help to heal the brokenness in each and every one of us. Forgive us for our sins. Give us the courage to confess them to you and to find grace in a relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ. It is in his name that we pray. 
as you taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please get out your Bibles and follow along as Claudia Steele reads our morning scripture lesson from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. This is a continuation of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And this morning, we look at what Jesus had to say about giving generously to those in need. This is a reading from Matthew, chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their, full, their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come before your word this morning and we give you thanks for the word that you have given to us. We pray that as we hear these words of Jesus, that we would let them sink into our lives and that we would live them out each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Just watched this recently. It's called I Care A Lot. And it's a film on Netflix that, while it's not a true story, it is based on a compilation of true stories related to the elder care industry, and specifically guardianship in the elder care industry. It's really a tragic tale of a woman played by Rosamund Pike who takes advantage of elderly people. She has this scam going on where she convinces a judge at a court that someone, an elderly person, usually a wealthy elderly person, is incapable of taking care of themselves or is being neglected by their children or something like that. And she gets these judges, she gets doctors who are in on the scam with her to declare them incompetent or incapacitated or in some sort of emergency situation. And then she gets the judge to sign them over to her care where she then takes over their lives, moves them out of their homes, puts them into a rest home, drugs them up on medications, and takes over their financial matters, controls who they can and cannot see, and takes them away from their kids. It's a tragic story, and I don't tell it to you today in order to upset you or in order to make you worry. We're going to be talking about how to get over worries. But I share this story with you because it illustrates for us a very important point, not just about the elder care industry and who we place our trust in, but in who we place our trust in in everyday life. And, and here's the point that I came away with as we looked at this person who was trying to take advantage of people versus others in the elder care industry and in the guardianship space who really are trying to do their best to care for the needs of the people that they take care of. And, and here's the point. Motives matter. Motives matter. And that's really what Jesus is driving home for us today in this passage of Scripture. He's not talking about the elder care industry, of course, but he's talking about our motivations for helping others. Jesus says that we should not do our acts of righteousness before others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. In other words, this is what Jesus is telling us. He's telling us that our motives matter. And he's challenging us to question our motives, 
Just like we would question the motives of somebody who is trying to take advantage of someone we love, Jesus says we should question our own motives when it comes to the way that we interact with people, when it comes to the way that we give. Our motives matter. So let me ask you this. Are your motives pure? Are your motives right? When you do something for someone else, when you act righteously, when you serve others, when you give to others, are you doing so out of the right motivations? Because the reward that we get for that is dependent on the motivations that we bring to that. And it is about a reward. It shouldn't be, but it is. Let's be honest with ourselves. And there are different types of rewards that we can get from this. We hope for a heavenly reward one day, that the things that we do on this earth will make this world a better place, will help other people find Jesus, and will end up with us having an eternal reward someday. But is that our true motive? Is that really why we do what we do? Jesus challenges us on that, and he does so by laying out for us two different types of rewards. And the first is earthly rewards. And we see that spoken of in verses 1 and 2. I've shared the first one with you already. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So, he specifies here what act of righteousness he's talking about. It's giving to the needy. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. That's an earthly reward. And the earthly reward that they're looking for involves an understanding of appreciation that I really hope to drive home for you today appreciation. And, and why am I focusing on that? It's because this sermon series that we've been on the last couple of weeks, it's about changing one thing can change everything. And what is the one thing that we need to change? It's our perspective. We looked at it a couple of weeks ago, and we're going to continue to look at it in the weeks ahead. But ultimately, it comes down to Jesus saying, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and God's righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you as well. That is the major shift of perspective that we need to have from a, an us first to a God first perspective. But I believe that there are different shifts that need to take place in order for us to get there. And the first perspective shift relates to this concept of appreciation. There's different ways to look at appreciation. One of the ways that we look at appreciation is the idea of seeking appreciation. And, and this is the earthly reward, all right? When we are seeking appreciation for what we gave, we're missing the point. And that's what Jesus was saying the hypocrites did. Don't announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do. Don't do your acts of righteousness in front of everyone so that publicly everybody can see what you do. When you do it that way, you have your reward. You wanted to get noticed. And guess what? You got noticed. There's your reward. Jesus says you're missing the point. You're missing out on a greater reward from God when you do these acts, not to get noticed by others, but to simply follow the ways of Jesus, impacting the lives of others. And then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And we'll look at what that reward is in a moment. But first, let's focus on these earthly rewards. These earthly rewards of wanting to gain appreciation, seeking appreciation for what you gave. And another way that we seek that appreciation for earthly rewards is we seek admiration and affirmation. We want the admiration of others. We want people to notice how good we are, how nice we are, how much we've given, how much we've done, how much we've served. We want to be admired. These are human traits, okay? I'm not going to fault you for having them. I have them as well. We all do. But Jesus challenges us to check our motivations. Is this why we do things? Because we want to seek that affirmation. Because we want to seek that admiration. Because we want to seek that appreciation. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. If we seek appreciation for what we gave, we will never get enough. We'll never get enough. We can never know 
how much appro appreciation is enough. And let me tell you a couple stories to help to highlight that. First story involves a friend of mine who came to my office several years ago, and it was a tragic day. I'll never forget it. He came to my office and he pulled out his wallet and he handed me a $100 bill and a $50 bill. And he said, this $150 is the proceeds that I got from selling my wedding ring. He had been through a divorce. His marriage didn't work out. And he said, I had no use for that ring anymore. So I want to donate this money to the church and I want you to use it to bless someone, to help strengthen a marriage, to help give hope to a family, to do something positive with this brokenness that never quite worked out for me the way that I hoped it would. My heart broke as he handed that to me because I, I knew his pain, or it, I didn't know his pain, but I, I, I knew the pain that he had been going through in some sense because we had shared that journey a little bit as friends. But that sacrifice that he made, what do I do with it? I felt the weight of trying to figure out how can I use this money to do something good? How can I use this money to somehow redeem what was broken and lost in his life? And so I thought of this person that I knew who was serving God and who wasn't making a lot of money and who had just had a baby. And I thought, you know what, let's give it to this family and have them just use it for whatever it is that they need. And so I shared this with my friend and shared the idea. He loved it. So we wrote this card kind of explaining the scenario. I put the $150 in the card, sealed it up, addressed it, put it in the mail. And then we kind of waited. Um, you know, we weren't looking for a thank you. We weren't looking for any affirmation, admiration, appreciation for that sake. But I, I wanted to hear something for a couple of reasons. One, I wanted to make sure that this family got it. Uh, two, I wanted to be able to share with my friend how that money impacted them in a positive way to give him some hope and to give him some sense of redemption over what he had lost and, and what he had wanted to see happen through this. Never heard a word. Never heard a word. And eventually I kind of forgot about it because, I, again, I, I didn't want to add worry to this whole scenario. That wasn't the point. But uh, about a year and a half later, I ran into this individual who we had sent the card to while I was with my friend. And so at that point, I, I introduced them and I said, hey, this is the guy that we sent that money to you a few years ago. Did you, did you ever remember that or did you get it? And, and he, he thought about it and tried to remember and he said, no, I don't think so. And so he checked with his wife and she said, no, we never got anything. And he said, just never came. And we don't know what happened to that. We have no idea what happened to that uh, gift that, we, that my friend had given. And, and it, it saddened us because we really wanted it to go and bless somebody else. Maybe it did bless somebody else. Maybe somebody stole it. Maybe it got misplaced. We have no idea. But the point that I want to make about that story is that because I had an expectation on that gift, because I wanted in my humanness, to hear something, not for myself, but for my friend, I ended up being the person that passed this gift along, but then worrying inside about whether or not it was received, worrying about whether or not it was appreciated, worrying about whether or not it did what we had hoped that it would do, bless them in some way. And, and when we do that, when we want to seek appreciation for what we gave, we will never have enough. Have you, have you ever done that? Have you ever given a gift to someone and then just kind of waited and, and wondered, are, are they going to thank me? Are they going to use that for the purposes that I sent it for? Uh, it, once we put these stipulations on it, it adds to our worries. Do you see that? If we want to have a worry-free life, if we want to move from being a perennial worrier to a prayerful warrior, we've got to let some of those things go. We've got to shift our perspective on what we think about appreciation. And instead of seeking appreciation for what we gave, which will never lead us to enough, we need to instead look to these eternal rewards. Instead of earthly rewards, eternal rewards. And those eternal rewards look at a different side of appreciation. Rather than seeking appreciation for what we gave, the eternal rewards is to gain appreciation for what we have. Do you see the difference there? 
There's a difference between seeking appreciation for what we gave and gaining appreciation for what we have. And when we gain an appreciation for what we have, we will always have an abundance. We will always have the right focus because God has given us so much. God has done so much for us and blessed us in so many ways. And when we can understand that and when we can come to appreciate all that God has given, all that we already have, then we have an abundance for which to be grateful, an abundance for which to give thanks. And that, my friends, is the type of appreciation that we should have. That is the type of appreciation that Jesus teaches us about in this passage. Instead of looking for the affirmation, admiration, appreciation of others, as those hypocrites do, Jesus says it this way in verses 3 and 4, But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And what are the rewards of God? I believe some of the rewards of God that we see are we get this sense of godly peace and godly joy. There is a peace that passes understanding, and that can be yours today through Jesus when we accept Christ and when we begin to pattern our lives after the teachings of Jesus. And that's one of the reasons why we're in this study right now, looking at this Sermon on the Mount, looking at these teachings on worry, trying to shift our perspective so that we finally get it. Because once we get it here, then we can begin to get it here. And then we begin to see transformation in our lives as we live according to the teachings of Jesus and as we experience that godly peace and that godly joy that Jesus offers to us. I want to close with a story that is a very personal story for me. And I'll set it up this way. I was waiting for a phone call from my parents because I had called them and left a message. I wanted to talk with them directly, uh, but they weren't home. I was in a, a difficult situation. And so I left them a message and then I, I waited to hear back. And I wasn't able to answer the phone when they called back, but I saw the message light blinking when I came home one day. And so I, I hit that message light and, and these are the words that I heard from my dad. No. We won't loan you the money. I'll tell you, when I heard those words, my heart just sank. My heart just sank because we were in a situation where we needed some money to help us get through a rough patch in life. And we had applied for a loan from the bank, a line of credits, because we, we didn't want to borrow from my parents. We didn't want to borrow from anybody, but we tried to get this loan from the bank. They came back with this exorbitant interest rate, and we just knew that was not going to be feasible for us. We had exhausted all other resources, and, and in desperation, I'd asked my parents. And I really I hated to ask them to borrow the money. Um, don't do that often. I think that might have been the first time. But I was just devastated when I, when I heard that voice on the answering machine. There was a pause. No, we won't loan you the money. Heart sinks. Heart starts to beat fast. What am I going to do now? My mind just began to race, and I wasn't sure what to do. And then my dad continued. No, we won't loan you the money, but we will give you the money. You don't have to pay us back. Now, it wasn't a huge amount of money, but it was a significant amount enough for us that we couldn't come up with it on our own. And we felt guilty asking my parents for it. And then when they just gave it to us, uh, it really blew me away with their generosity. And, and here's, here's the, the point that I want to make from this, that my parents understood that I think Jesus teaches here. And, and this is it. When you give something with expectation of getting something back, you lose out on that godly peace and that, that godly joy. And it just adds to your worry. It adds to your worry because then you worry about, am I going to get paid back? Are they going to appreciate it enough? Are they going to use it in the way that I think that they should use it? When you give a gift with strings attached, it adds worry to your life. Instead, what my parents did and what Jesus advocates doing is just give freely. When you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, don't keep track. Don't count 
on appreciation. Don't count on recognition. Don't do it for the admiration or the affirmation of other people. Just do it because it's the right thing to do. Do it because you feel Jesus calling you to it and you want to obey and be a good steward of what Jesus has given you and you want to be a good servant who Jesus can trust to help others. When we get that, when we do that, we come closer, so much closer to this idea of learning to move from being a perennial warrior to being a prayerful warrior. And, and changing one thing can change everything when we change our perspective. So I want you to change your perspective on appreciation, that idea of appreciation, seeking appreciation for what you gave, which you'll never get enough of, versus gaining an appreciation for what you have, which will help you always to live in an abundance. And, and really, I believe that God models that for us in powerful ways. Jesus teaches us this concept right here in Matthew 6. But Jesus goes on to live it out at the end of Matthew, doesn't he? When Jesus goes to the cross, Jesus goes to the cross and gives us this incredible gift, an offer of salvation and grace that we don't deserve. But Jesus doesn't demand that we take it. Jesus doesn't give it with strings attached. Jesus just says, here, this is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. This is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. And when we wrap our minds and our hearts around the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, and we, when we wrap our minds and our hearts around the idea that Jesus doesn't create us as robots who have to respond in one way or another, Jesus gives us the choice of whether or not we're going to respond and how we will respond to that message of grace. And once we get that and we respond to that message of grace, we recognize our brokenness. That's the gospel message, isn't it? That we have to recognize our sinfulness. We have to recognize our own brokenness, that we can't fix this life on our own. We need someone greater than ourselves. We need someone better than us. And that person is Jesus Christ. And so Jesus offers us this gift without expectation, without strings attached. Jesus offers us forgiveness and mercy and grace. Have you yet accepted that gift? Have you confessed your sins and asked Jesus to forgive you and asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life? If you're at the first steps of this journey, that's the first step is confessing your sins, recognizing your brokenness, and asking Jesus to heal you. And I encourage you to do that today if you haven't already. If you've already made that decision, if you've already given your life to Jesus, then let's take some more steps down the road. And, and those steps involve following the teachings of Jesus and living the ways of Jesus. And what we've learned today is that living the way of Jesus involves getting this proper grasp of appreciation and this idea of giving to the needy, giving to others, not for what we get, not for what we gain, but simply because God calls us to. And when God blesses us, we have the opportunity to pass those blessings on to others. Are you giving of yourself? Are you giving of your life? Are you serving others? Are you finding ways to do these acts of righteousness not to seek appreciation for what you gave, but instead to gain appreciation for what you have. That is the message of the gospel. That is the message that Jesus teaches you today. And I hope that you will take that home with you and that you will gain that appreciation for what you have, for what God has given to us all. Let's pray. Almighty God, we come before you today and we give you thanks for this message Thank you, Lord, for the teachings of Jesus on what we should truly appreciate and on how we should give and on the rewards that we seek. Lord, our motives matter. Let us be motivated by the right things so that our reward might be an eternal reward forever in your presence. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 
for our offering time and our ministry moment today, I want to share with you a thank you card that I received recently. It's nice to be able to receive these and then to be able to share them with all of you. It says, Dear Reverend Vanderhoff, please accept this simple note as heartfelt for both of your very generous donations in recent months. The mission cannot continue to do the work God called us here to do without your church's gifts. You allow us to not only provide warm meals and beds, but more important, share Jesus Christ with our residents. So thank you and God bless. And this is a card that came from the Washington City Mission because our church has worked hard to try to support the work of that city mission uh, most recently just by a couple of uh, significant donations that we've been able to give to them because God has blessed us with an abundance and we pass on those blessings to make an impact in the lives of others. You're a part of that. Your gifts make a difference right here at Trinity Church, but also in the community around us, places like the Washington City Mission and even all around the world. I invite you to continue to give to Trinity Church and to make a difference in the world through your generous donations and through your faithful discipleship. Let's pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the ways that you have blessed us. Lord, may we pass along those blessings to others. May we do that not just to meet physical needs, but also to meet spiritual needs. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please enjoy the music of our anthem, I Will Rise, used with permission.
And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. This thing won't go together. We are continuing our sermon series on... I can never remember these things. And so if we were looking inside of this bigger egg... My smaller egg just fell on the ground. Let's start this over again. Forget that one.